name is Sean, and this is The Beers All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode 11. The first episode after our big episode 10 extravaganza party. Uh, the first thing I want to do here today is to revisit very briefly two of the topics of our last episode. The first is President Trump's attempt to sabotage Social Security by getting companies to not withhold the payroll tax. And the second one will be the post office. And yes, there is a little bit of news on both. In the last two episodes, I explained how insane this idea to defer the payroll tax is, not only because it would kill Social Security, but also because employers would simply not play along. I told you that they would either just not withhold the money, despite the order, or that they would simply dump it into some sort of safe account until they were forced to deal with it. Well, this is all beginning to come true. Almost 30 groups, each representing industrial interests, with the usually steadfastly Republican and conservative U.S. Chamber of Commerce leading the charge, sent a letter to the White House to make them aware that they have no intention of following this executive order. Hell, even the IRS chimed in and told companies to not defer these taxes. The letter states that this order from the president is unworkable and possibly even realistically impossible at a technical level. These organizations stated that they would not follow the order and would not defer this money to, and allow it to pass to their employees and burden them with a massive year-end tax burden. To quote the letter, quote, Therefore, many of our members will likely decline to implement deferral, choosing instead to continue to withhold and remit to the government the payroll taxes required by law, end quote. It is important to once again point out that if these deferrals were to take place and the money were then given to the employees in their paychecks, these employees would then be burdened with end-of-year tax bills of over $2,000 in some instances, and they would have to pay that money back immediately. This is insane on its face. Now, to be fair to Trump, he has talked about getting these taxes to be forgiven somehow, to be absolved via congressional mandate. And that might seem good on its face to get up to $2,000 or more and not have to pay it back. Hell, I'd really love to get $2,000 right now. I really would. But it's not going to happen. Congress will not give this mandate. And like we talked about last episode, this is exactly how Social Security is funded. And Social Security is amazing and wonderful, and it would be killed by a move like this in our current paradigm. This move by Trump is simply a pander to wage workers, and at its core, a bribe for votes. It's that simple. In fact, it's as simple as it is stupid, and frankly, we should all be insulted that it is even being tried. We can't allow this to go on, and even the Chamber of Commerce agrees with that. And the Chamber of Commerce is a horrifically terrible organization. Now, the Chamber of Commerce itself might be a topic for a future podcast, but I want to touch on it here for a few minutes. The Chamber of Commerce, for those who might not know, and I didn't realize this myself until just a few years ago, has nothing to do with the government. Or more precisely, I guess, I should say that it's not part of the government, not a governmental organization of any sort. The United States Chamber of Commerce is a conservative lobbying group that almost always supports Republicans in conservative legislation. Oh, and it's absolutely massive. It is the single largest annual spender in the yearly congressional auctions where corporations and lobby groups purchase our politicians. In 2018, the Chamber of Commerce spent $94,800,000. And that was over 25% more than the next highest purchaser of our government, the Realtors Association, who clocked in at just under $73 million. Even more amazing, the Chamber of Commerce spent over $136 million in 2012 and tripled the next highest bidders. Again, the Realtors Association, who spent $41,400,000. And I went off on that little tangent there because I want you to understand who and what the Chamber of Commerce is, and I want you to consider that even they, 
even those most massive corruptors of government and democracy, even they were unable to go along with this incoherent, foolish, and insane Trump idea. That's how fundamentally deranged this whole thing is. Even the Chamber of Commerce stepped back and said, Whoa, let's pump the brakes there, Chief. And now, the second issue, the post office. We have some heartening news out of Washington State. In Seattle-Tacoma Bulk Mail Center, postal workers began defying leadership and they started to reinstall the eight machines which were disconnected and moved into a corner of the facility. And as we outlined previously here, these actions, the sidelining of machines, combined with many others, have delayed mail all across the nation in a purposeful attempt to destroy the Postal Service. I won't dig too deep on the particulars here because episodes 9 and 10 cover this pretty extensively, but the results have been pretty terrible. What I will say is that this willful protest by the ground-level workers here is absolutely amazing and inspiring. These people are heroes, no doubt about it. It's our duty to defy immoral orders like this, and to do so with such solidarity really can show what the working class is capable of, even under intense pressure from none other than the President of the United States himself, a position which is usually the most powerful office in the world. This move by these postal workers highlights two things. The first is the absolute impotence of the Democratic Party to mount an effective opposition to Trump or the Republicans. Actually, it also highlights the complete and utter moral failings and spinelessness of Republican lawmakers as well. But of course, that's par for the course, at least during my lifetime. Strongly worded letters do nothing, nor do sharply worded tweets. Speeches during the Democratic National Convention, all of them littered with the same bullshit talking points and finger-wagging nonsense, don't do a damn thing either. You know what's actually resisting anything at all right now? Workers. And not just workers, but unionized workers. If you consider yourself a Democrat, or even an Independent, or hell, even if you are registered as a Republican, but you can still think for yourself, start supporting unions and worker protections, because both of these things are under attack right now by conservative Democrats and Republicans, as well as this administration and its friends. And I just want to highlight a few things that Trump has done to harm workers. In 2019, the Trump administration continued the Republican-led fight to prevent an Obama-era overtime law that would have granted overtime to 6 million more workers than the law covered at the time. That meant that these 6 million workers would have been legally entitled to receive extra pay for working more than 40 hours in a particular work week. As insane as it is to think that people would actually fight against us, we need to remember that our politicians are purchased by business interests and those business interests did not want to pay people the overtime that they rightly deserved. So they sued. And they fought this rule for five years. And if we are being honest with ourselves, they mostly won. In the end, nearly 3 million workers will still be unable to collect overtime pay with this new rule. The administration is attempting to overturn the decision by the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, in the famous, if you're a dork like me, Browning Ferris Industries case on joint employment. To be simple and not bore anyone, this decision is based on Browning Ferris, a garbage company who had its own BFI employees as well as contract workers from another firm called Lead Point Industries. The lead point BFI employees sought union representation and the union moved to bargain with both BFI and lead point as co-employers of these workers. The union was forced to sue when the companies refused to negotiate and the union won that case. This decision is extremely important right now because of the fragmentation of employment in this country. Because of this explosion in independent contractors and gig work, Many workers find themselves with two bosses when they are contracted out. This co-employment scenario is custom-built to exploit workers in a multitude of ways, and unionizing is one of the best and most sturdy methods that these workers have to exert their own collective power. If they unionize, they must be allowed to bargain with both employers, not just one of them. And the NLRB, the organization who rules on these sorts of things, agrees. Now Trump is trying to overturn this decision through the courts and leave millions outside the benefits of overtime pay. 
Now Trump is trying to overturn this de this decision through the courts and leave millions outside of the benefits of overtime pay. And speaking of the Supreme Court, let us not forget the Murphy Oil Epic Systems Ernst Young case. You guys remember that one, right? Yeah, probably not. But you can Google Murphy Oil Supreme Court for the specifics. Basically, the Supreme Court decided three cases at once, all of them essentially the same thing. Employees signed a contract which contained a clause for forced arbitration, but the employees wanted to file a class action lawsuit instead of arbitration and were denied. So they sued for the right to band together and fight as one unit. And then the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the employers. Because of course they ruled in favor of the employers. It's the Supreme Court. It's loaded with conservative justices. And what this means is that huge swaths of workers are now prevented from joining class action suits against employers. And this is incredibly unfair and just unbelievably cruel and disempowering. Because right now, if a company does something wrong to multiple employees, even thousands of employees, and they decide to fight back against it, they are forced into arbitration. They are forced to battle massive corporations as individuals, one at a time. Oh, and the arbitrators? They get paid by... Now, just take a deep breath and take a wild fucking guess who pays the arbitrators. Yeah, the giant corporations. And one thing that we all know or we all should know, is that the individual has virtually no power to fight Globochem, the giant multi-billion dollar conglomerate, with its own legal department and millions of dollars for outside counsel. The only hope workers have to fight these monstrosities is by banding together in class action, and the Supreme Court just destroyed that meager leverage. Now, I'm going to read here a paragraph from the scotusblog.com website, and it's from an article entitled, Employers Prevail in Arbitration Case. And I think it cuts to the quick. Quote, Ginsburg, and that's Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, lamented that today's ruling will lead to the under-enforcement of federal and state statutes designed to advance the well-being of vulnerable workers because it will rarely be worthwhile for individual employees to pursue their own claims. Even if they might otherwise be willing to do so, she added, they will also likely fear retaliation if they go it alone. The upshot, Ginsburg concluded, is that employers will no doubt perceive that the cost-benefit balance of underpaying workers tips heavily in favor of skirting legal obligations. End quote. Worker rights and protections have been under attack since the first day we began to fight for them, and since the first day that we actually got them. That these attacks continue is nothing new. What is new is the frequency and savagery of these assaults under Donald Trump. The working class and unions are being hollowed out and destroyed by these decisions. And these decisions and these attacks will be just a few of Trump's many despicable legacies. Okay, now for the part you've all been waiting for. Now I want to get into my views on equivalence, bias, and truth. Now this is a subject I wrote about on my blog. So if you're one of the five people who read that piece, feel free to bail out right here and know that I still love and appreciate you. But if you're not one of those five people, stick around. And the reason why I want to go into this in a bit of detail here is because I get a lot of questions about bias. My own, what I think about this person or that person's bias, this news place or that one. And we usually say that they are biased in some way. But how? Sometimes we can tell contextually, but oftentimes the bias isn't so clear. So how do we deal with this? How do I deal with this? Well, allow me to explain. So as I was thinking about starting a blog originally, and now this podcast, I knew what sorts of subjects, at least broadly, that I would be writing about. I didn't really have to spend a lot of time thinking about that stuff. In fact, I have a list which I continue to solely work through even to this day, and this list was started more than two years ago. So while I didn't have to wonder so much about the actual individual subjects, what I did have to really ponder was how I would approach these subjects. 
Would I be extremely and intentionally biased and just come hard from way out in left field? I mean, this can be good because you get some hardcore supporters and you never let them down, right? Or should I be neutral and give equal voice to all sides? You know, prevent both sides and let the reader decide? You know, I, I mean, I guess I'd be getting in on that intellectual dark web griff space, you know? Get some Patreon money. But in the end, I realize that any attempt to either be coming from an extreme position or being neutral to show both sides would be doomed from the start. But this idea of neutrality, it was extremely alluring, and it took me a while to suss out exactly why and to figure out what I would do to deal with this problem. Eventually, I came to realize that to do anything other than be as honest as I could would be detrimental to anyone who would read what I wrote or listen to anything that I am saying right now. I knew that to present bad ideas alongside good and to treat them as equals would be to fall into false equivalency, and I was tr really trying not to do that. False equivalency is when we take two opposing ideas or viewpoints and we present them as equal in terms of validity and veracity, regardless of their relative merits, usually via some sort of tortured or false reasoning. As an example, I like to talk about flat earthers, those who believe we live on a flat disc-shaped world. Now, obviously, anybody who actually believes that is incorrect. We don't live on a disc, we live on a globe. However, if CNN were to feature a split-screen debate with a person who knows we live on a globe on one side and a flat earther on the other so as to present both sides, they do the viewer and the subject a great disservice. Especially, and this is an important distinction, if they present both sides uncritically. By treating both of these ideas, globe and disc worlds equally, CNN creates a sheen of legitimacy for the otherwise illegitimate view that our world was a disc. By elevating the flat earther to the same level as a scientist, it gives the illusion that the flat earther is just as important and that their idea has merit. And not merely merit, but actually a similar level of merit as a person who says we live on a globe. And listen, flat earth is a bit out there. I get it. But replace it with anti-vax, climate change deniers, or advocates for the war on drugs. Treating these people uncritically and giving them the same platform as doctors, climate scientists, and social activists is both wrong and dangerous. When we engage in false equivalency or even whataboutism in a misguided attempt to show both sides of an issue and avoid taking sides, we do, in fact, take sides. And the side we take is always that of the least meritorious or most distasteful idea. And the side we take is always that of the least meritorious or most distasteful idea. Every time we elevate a bad idea as being equal to a good idea, the good idea comes out worse off for it. Now there is a danger here, and I can hear a few of my good friends screaming this warning from wherever they listen to this. That argument is that sometimes the crazy guy is correct. And they're right. Sometimes the crazy guy is right. This warning is something which we should actually take very seriously. We should remain skeptical, not just of odd ideas, but also to the mainstream ideas. And we should give non-mainstream ideas some room to breathe as well. But we should always remain cautious and not let those ideas suffocate us when they are bad or harmful. When I began thinking about this problem, the bias issue, I was left to wonder, you know, why do we do this? Why do we bend towards pretending that we have no bias or that showing both sides is always good? Why do we fall into false equivalency? I think that there is a certain amount of false equivalency in political, social, and general discussion and debate. But really at its core, it's a cheap tactic used to derail a conversation and avoid deep, hard answers. In that realm of pseudo-debate that we see all over network news shows and YouTube in particular, but we could also toss in Facebook and Twitter here. False equivalency is used both as armor and weapon, and it is used with careless profligacy. In the social media stuff alone, that's probably a topic for a different episode. So I'm going to drop that here, but I think it's important to think about as we move on. And as I leave that stuff aside, the online debate nonsense and general misuse of equivalency, I'm going to spend a little time here to focus here on the media, um, reporters, bloggers, podcasters, and anyone else who may f 
you know, fall right around that area, myself included, obviously. One of the reasons I personally found it so hard to put aside the idea of being a neutral reporter, whether it was on my own blog or this podcast, was because there is sort of a cultural baggage that comes along with doing this. We have a very idealized vision in our head of what a reporter or newscaster should be. We tend to believe that they should just call balls and strikes, as it were, just stick to the so-called facts. And the concept of showing both sides and letting the reader decide is because of that idealized notion of reporting or writing or podcasting has baked directly into it a mythos of quote-unquote balance. Balance in the sense of reporting refers to giving an honest representation of differing perspectives on the same subject. Things like getting quotes and views from other sides or opinions of a story, like those who want and those who don't want a new dog park in the area, for example, or maybe getting a conservative and liberal viewpoint on a new tax law or foreign policy choice. Now, before I go on, I want to be clear about something. I don't want to discount balance and fairness. They are both incredibly important. Here's the thing, though. Truth should always be paramount. Truth is the most important thing. Telling the truth is the epitome of fairness. Balance is not. Truth must trump balance at all times, any time they get into conflict with each other. Neutrality is another bugaboo out there. It leads many well-meaning people to a cul-de-sac of thought. We must be neutral, we tell ourselves. We must not take sides. And this is fine, so long as we are honest. It is perfectly fine to report on an issue, be truthful, and not take sides. What we really should always remember is that being neutral does not mean giving equal merit to opposing ideas and viewpoints. If I'm being truthful and neutral, I may have to tell my listeners that one side of an issue is flawed or wrong, or perhaps even just plain evil. Truth must always be more important than dogmatic neutrality. And that dogmatic aspect is very, very important. This sort of thing can lead you down a path of Dave Rubin-like exchanging of ideas, where everybody involved just gets dumber and dumber and more insane. Not all ideas are good, and we have to be able and willing to say out loud which ones are silly and which ones are stupid and which ones are dangerous. And we have to be willing to do it out loud, and especially where and when it is not popular to do so. Balance or neutrality achieved by being less than truthful is putting idealism over integrity and fantasy over reality. When I think about why it is so hard to let some of these notions go, the notions of not appearing biased and of remaining neutral, I think that in the end, you know, I just didn't want to appear biased. At its core, that was pretty much it. I just did not want to appear to be biased. And I sometimes still have a hard time with this. I don't want to appear to be biased or ideological or be labeled as a member of some mass group identity. In fact, I pretty staunchly refuse to ascribe a particular label to my political and social views. I tend to think that doing so is like an intellectual water anchor that slows down our growth. But I'm rapidly getting over this, at least to a certain degree. I have views, I express them, and how others view it is none of my concern. Unless those people decide to engage in forthright conversation and help me learn or to educate themselves. As a matter of fact, I have come to the conclusion that there are many times that anyone who is trying to speak about a lot of these ideas simply must risk the appearance of being biased. And not just the appearance of being biased. We need to actually be biased. Because some ideas are just fucking stupid. And yes, I have stupid ideas too. And yeah, I even have fucking stupid ideas. To describe reality is, often enough, to take sides. Sometimes we just have to tell a listener that one idea is good and that the other idea is bad or wrong or evil or maybe even just half-formed or, you know, maybe uneducated. We need to worry less about presenting bad ideas as equal and worry more about being truthful and fair. Giving equal time and respect to flat earthers and scientists who know the world is round may be equal in a certain sense, but it is not truthful or fair. 
Fairness is treating each idea honestly by presenting it on both its worthiness and worthlessness, or just not presenting it, which is often the best choice. Because if we are being fair, then we have to expose bullshit for what it is. That is the very definition of fair. A few months ago, I wrote that President Trump was an awful human being on Facebook. And somebody wrote back and said, way to keep an open mind, lol. And listen, I'm sorry, but after four years of consistent evidence, I'm ready to close my mind up and make a decision. And that's fair. That's honest. I mean, go ahead and disagree if you want, but there does exist a line where we shouldn't happily cross. We might consider having an open mind of virtue, but if your mind is still open on any subject at all, after four years of constant evidence pouring in, then that virtue has become a massive, unrelenting fault and shortcoming. Moderation in all things, I suppose, even our open-mindedness. Personally, I am attempting to do my best to present ideas that I find worthwhile in as fair a way as possible. I certainly have a point of view, a bias, and if you read a couple of my blog posts or you listen to the first 10 episodes of this podcast, I am sure you can see it. While my own perspective tends towards being on the left side of the traditional political scale, I do my best to present the arguments from the other side as honestly and fairly as possible. And then, to the best of my meager ability, explain why I think it is incorrect and the other idea is better. What I am not trying to do is present both sides equally, only honestly and fairly. When I view a social or economic philosophy as harmful to society, I will not prop it up by giving it an equal platform with a philosophy that I believe will benefit society. What I will do is try my best to engage with that other philosophy, read about it, investigate, see if there is any good I can find in it, and be as honest as I can if I write or speak about it. I guess I do my best to steel man it, to borrow a phrase. As an example, I find libertarianism to be a rather inhumane ideology. But there are aspects about it which I can actually agree with, such as the idea of government overreach, personal responsibility, and even though I'm not incredibly familiar with it, the non-aggression principle sounds really excellent to me. Now, to branch off this line of thought just a bit, I wrote the following in a post about why I initially started my blog, entitled, In the Most Uncreative Way Possible, Why even bother blogging? It's such a bad title. Anyway, quote, It is through this lifelong attempt at my own education that I have developed a sense of morals, ethics, and principles. This development has become imbued in my socio-political views, and part of those views is that we must speak out when we see injustice, even if our voice is going to get lost in the wash of the next speaker's or get blown out by the next societal or political insanity, end quote. As an adult, I found my core beliefs before I paid even the slightest attention to politics. Those beliefs informed my values and what would be considered political views, not the other way around. If a certain idea goes against my values, then I simply cannot give that idea cover by blunting its potential harm. I have to be honest about it. To lie or equivocate would be to corrupt my core principles. While I do not have an extremely strong political ideological perspective, I do have an extremely strong moral and ethical perspective, which certainly bleeds into the political realm. Because of that, I am biased. And because of that, my podcasts are biased. And I have no intention of trying to be dogmatically neutral in either of them. That road leads to centrism which I wrote about in the past and will absolutely cover here in a coming episode. To be short and to the point, I am not a fan of the concept. My bias is to speak against ideas and values I find repugnant and harmful, and to speak for ideas and values I find humane and helpful. I strive, though I may stumble, and I often do, to be honest and fair with what I say and write, but I won't compromise my ideals for neutrality. Neutrality favors the oppressor, and false equivalence favors the worst idea. Elsewhere, I am okay with news organizations attempting to be fair. 
I am okay with a news organization attempting to show both sides and let the reader decide. I am even okay with news organizations being biased. But let's be honest about it. Let's be upfront about it. How about this? How about, welcome to Fox News, conservative news for the waiting room. Or, welcome to CNN, center-right news for the elderly. Or, we here at MSNBC present the corporate liberal news for loons. Or maybe the big city paper, where we present all ideas equally, even the dumb ones. Reader beware. I am even okay with being biased myself. See, I view bias as being fine, so long as we are upfront and honest about it. When we understand where a reporter is coming from, what agenda or bias they may be pursuing or pushing, that allows, oddly enough, for trust. If Bob Smith is a declared conservative Republican, and I read his article with that understanding, I am then able to take that into account. Bob Smith has been honest with me and not pretended that he is this mythical centrist with no bias. I can now trust him to a certain extent. I might completely and utterly disagree with him, or I might even find some level of common ground, but at least I know his agenda. The same idea goes for entire websites and news groups as well. And this is a little bit of a weird factor, but the more a news organization or a writer tells us how balanced they are, the less we believe them. And our disbelief is not just about their claim of being balanced either. We stop believing them at all, about anything. They lose our trust because they are lying to us right off of the starting line. As an example, Fox News used to use the tagline, Fair and Balanced, all while pushing a clearly conservative agenda. Later, they used, We Report, You Decide. And they still push that same conservative ideology. How can anyone trust them when they lie right on their logo screen and letterheads? Then Fox began using a new tagline. Real news, real honest opinion. Now obviously this is a little better, but something like real conservative news, real conservative opinion would be better. That last one, that's a tagline that people can trust. And if Fox News presented a new tagline like the one I suggested back there, Maybe I'd trust them a little bit more. At least it would be out there, and they would not be seeking the safety that their empty claims of fairness provide them. They would be free to just give conservative news unapologetically, and I could maybe trust that even though they are conservative, at least they are being honest. And, I mean, you know, it's still Fox News, so I probably wouldn't trust them even if they changed their tagline. But my larger point still stands. Now, before I leave you, I just want to add one other thing. Balance isn't always a bad thing. It can be good and is often invaluable. Take the example I mentioned briefly earlier, the proposed creation of a city dog park. If you're reporting on that and being balanced and presenting both sides of the issue to the public is a good thing. Get some quotes from both the pro and anti-park crowd. Get some data from the neighboring town where they already have a park. Put it all in the article. However, if you hate dogs, you might want to let people know. And the same if you love them and volunteer at the local shelter. Just let people know and be honest. Or, if you're going to have a discussion on your news show about which diet and lifestyle is the best, get an omnivore, a vegetarian, and a vegan on. Let them talk about their views on the subject, why they eat what they eat, the benefits and drawbacks, you know, that's probably a good level of balance. Where it all falls apart is when you decide that you are going to put on a supposed sun gazer, someone who says that they no longer eat or drink and that they get all of their nutrients from the sunlight. At this point, you've given an equal platform to a charlatan in pursuit of balance. The same can be said about a science issue. When 99.9% of scientists agree Then having a wingnut on who doesn't agree, and you know, I don't mean general disagreement here either, like they take umbrage with the efficacy of a study. I mean like they disagree that the earth is round, and a misguided attempt at being fair and presenting both sides, that's a mistake and directly harmful. We should aim to be balanced wherever possible, but truthful always. 
And I just want to thank you guys for listening to episode 11. If you want to continue the conversation in any way, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. You can just search at Tribunus Media on either of those platforms. Um, and we also have a Instagram. It's Tribunus underscore media. And uh, yeah, I'm just deeply appreciated for everybody who listens to this, everybody who rates and reviews and five stars. And you guys are all awesome. And I love you. And thanks. I'll see you next episode.